evening, everyone. We are going to get started with the evening. It will be a lot of information. So we put together the packets for you. If you did not bring a pen, we do have pens on the back table. My, my name is Bridget De Silva. I'm the director of the High School Counseling and Support Services Department. And this is one of our guidance counselors, Danny McGrath. He has students in the alphabet A through DA last names. And we also have Pamela with us. She will be doing the presentation tonight. Pamela? Thank you. Thank you, Bridget, and welcome to all of you here tonight from Dartmouth High School. It's my first session tonight that I've done this year, but I've done the, many of them over the years. I will let you know that the session should be about an hour long. And what we're looking for today is for you to learn the necessary facts of financial aid process and all the re uh, free resources that are available to you to assist you with the process. I'm going to save questions until the very end, and I will be here until the last person leaves. This is financial information, and even though many of your questions might be something that everyone might benefit from, they're personal questions as well and so I respect your privacy and I'll be happy to answer those individual questions at the end of the session. For all of you, you should have a copy of the handout which is all the slides that we'll be discussing tonight. There's also a evaluation that we'd appreciate that after the program that you complete the evaluation and there's also a sheet from the um, Educational Opportunity Center, which will assist you with completing the FAFSA if you, and I'll be talking a little bit about that during the session. So we're going to walk through the financial aid process and hopefully re re um, relieve some of the stress. Come on in, everybody. So first I'm going to talk to you about the session itself. This is put together not by me, it's put together by MIFA. MIFA is, uh, I think you're familiar with it because you hear the loans that MIFA has available, but MIFA is a public service organization um, in helping families to navigate through the financial aid process. Personally, being a parent myself, I use this as a resource. It's, it's just, it's all there. What I'd recommend that you all do is take the uh, documents that you have tonight, bring them home, put them in a bright colored folder, and keep it on the dining room table, away from all the rest of all those papers that might be on your dining room table, uh, and use this as a resource. It has all websites, phone numbers, etc. The other thing is on the MIFA website, which is um, MIFA.org, there is a lot of excellent information. There's also something that's called the MIFA Pathway, which is a great resource, and there's also um, MIFA.org, which will have this webinar. So if you feel like maybe I skimmed over something or you're just not clear, you can see this whole session done by another individual. And speaking of um, watching this, DCTV is tonight, so when you put on Channel 9 on your local TV, you'll be able to see this presentation and view it as well. Okay. So for tonight, the topics that we'll be covering will be finding about the different types and sources of financial aid, reviewing the application process, understanding how the decisions are made. We'll follow up with learning about paying for college after financial aid, and then discovering the free resources that are available. So starting off with the sources of financial aid. So what is financial aid? Well, there's mainly there's three types of financial aid. There's the grants and scholarships, there's, um, which would be gift aid, there's federal work study, and then there's also loans. Financial aid is meant simply money used to help students pay for college. The uh, work study will not come off a student's bill. That's money that will typically come in the form of a paycheck to the student, so that wouldn't come off the bill. The um, loans are also considered financial aid. And the reason they're considered financial aid is because they have special repayment 
terms, for in most cases, students are not able to acquire a loan from their local bank. The federal government has set up these loans at reasonable interest rates. They won't need a co-signer, and they've been, most students are eligible for student loans. You do not have to accept student loans or work study. So keep that in mind as well. It will be offered to you, but you can decline them. So look at all the buckets. And you see the biggest bubble there with the federal loans. That stu student loans are the largest resource for financial aid. Um, there's also a tax credit that's available. So when you're meeting with your accountant and during tax season, this is something where uh, it can make a big difference when you're doing your taxes and the amount that you pay. So for the different sources of federal aid, we have four different buckets here. The federal, the Massachusetts, from the college and university, and then other agencies. So think about that for a second. Federal, state, the school that you're attending, and then the other things, the private scholarships and those things. And this is what we're going to be speaking about right now. For federal, most of the federal grants are awarded to the lowest income families. The work study is typically um, f reserved for students also with financial aid. Every student is able to apply for financial aid and can receive student loans, the tax incentives on the federal tax return. For the state, most state grants, just like federal grants, are awarded to the students that are the lower income. Massachusetts offers scholarships and tuition waivers who meet certain criteria. Recipients must be mass residents at least for one year, and you can visit the OSFA website to get the detail on that. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is after you re complete your FAFSA, at some point in time, you're going to receive a letter from OSFA, which is the Massachusetts Office of Financial Assistance, and for many of you, it's going to say you're not eligible. And it's discouraging because then you're thinking you're not getting anything. That's just from OSFA. So please don't make that assumption that when you get this letter from Massachusetts that, oh, I'm not getting anything at all. That's just one piece of the pie. There's also a new Mass Grant Plus program for the high-need part-time students at community colleges. So any students that are looking at going to BCC or Cape Cod Community or any of the community colleges, you might want to pursue that. Some colleges and universities do have their own loan programs. But by um, submitting your FAFSA application, you're applying for federal, Massachusetts, and institutional aid. You should be looking online now for the outside and the private scholarships. You find these also, there's a great list available on MIFA. You'll hear me all night referencing the MIFA.org. My recommendation is that you go through that website and see the resources that are on there. So if you go through, you might read through a lot of different scholarships, but if you hit that one, if you look for an hour and you hit one, that's for $1,000, that's a pretty well-spent hour, okay? And that being said, the uh, Dartmouth High School, they use the Naviance tool for all of their scholarships, so I highly recommend that you utilize that. There's also things like um, the Dartmouth Alumni Association. Um, there's a lot of local um, scholarships, local churches, the VW, the banks, um, the credit unions. There are quite a few resources, and they have to sometimes dig a little bit for those. So put your feelers out, talk to different parents, who have students maybe that are already in college and you might find a resource. So for the federal direct student loans, the student is the sole borrower. You should always be considering federal loans before the private loans because when you look at the interest rates and you look at the repayments, there's definitely advantage to those loans. The direct loans, for this would be unsubsidized and subsidized, those are student loans. 
So the direct loans for an incoming student, for a freshman, you'll start off at $3,500 um, and another $2,000, so maybe $5,500, but it goes up each year. So it'll be $3,500 as a freshman, $4,500 as a sophomore, $5,500 as a junior, and then another $5,500 for a senior. And when you're looking, I'm not sure what's up on the screen, but they also have uh, unsubsidized loan, and that would be another 2000 So the bottom line is, and I'm giving you an overview today, I don't expect you to know all the details, there is a difference between an unsubsidized loan and a subsidized loan. The interest rates are the same, but the subsidized loan, the federal government will subsidize the interest while the student's in school. So if the student borrows 3500 as a freshman, when they leave school, it could be four years later, two years later, where, wherever, they will still owe that 3500 under the subsidized loan program. For the unsubsidized loan, the interest begins accruing when they borrow. They don't need to begin repayment while they're in school, but that interest will accrue. So they could be begin repayment of the principal and the interest, just the interest, just the principal, or not pay anything at all until they leave school. But the bottom line for you folks is the subsidized is the best loan for the student to receive. For all students, when they're borrowing this program, it's all done online um, as far as completing the master promissory note do one promissory note. They also do an entrance counseling, which gives them the ins and outs of that loan, talks about the repayment, that sort of thing. And I strongly encourage the student to be in the driver's seat when they're completing the master promissory note and doing that loan counseling. You can sit beside them, but it lets them know that they own that loan and that you're their coach. All U.S. citizens and permanent residents are eligible to apply for the direct loans. The other piece in there is a, it's called a Parent PLUS loan. And again, this is a direct loan, but it's set up by the Department of Ed. And it's for the parent to apply for a PLUS loan. If a parent is denied for that PLUS loan, and it's credit-based, so sometimes you're eligible and sometimes you're not. The student can borrow an additional $4,000 for the, um, each of the first two years, and then $5,000 once they're a junior, and another five once they're a senior. But the parent would have to apply for that Parent PLUS loan and be denied. We're gonna talk a little bit about the loans, because as I say, it is a big part of financial aid, but there's the other grants and scholarships too, but I'll talk a little bit more about the loans in a bit. For right now, the average debt for students for the direct loans is just over 28000 and that comes out to about $300 a month for 10 years. So just so that you have that little piece of information and what the future is going to look like. There are many private loans that are out there that offer multiple repayment options and allow families to start making payments while the student's in school, or you also can defer, and those are the private loans. Merit-based aid. Only some schools award merit-based aid. So this is when your homework as a working with your child really comes into play, where you wanna see from the, the websites what are the financial aid packages looking at for different schools? It really varies, and I'm gonna go into some different, without naming specific schools, I'll give some examples of how different financial aid awards can be for the same student at the different schools. So they vary significantly from college to college. Some Merit scholarships have deadlines earlier than the admissions and the financial aid applications. So when you're looking on these websites for the different schools, you really need to be paying attention to the deadlines. Can't emphasize that enough. Most merit-based aid does come from the institution. 
One example of merit-based aid is the John and Abigail Adams, and that's actually from the state. And that's based on the students' 10th grade MCAS scores. There's no application. Traditionally, it's around December or January that the Adams letters come from the state letting you know whether you're eligible for this fee credit. I'm sorry, tuition credit. And that's a most important distinction because remember that it's just the tuition. So the tuition and fees at a school that will say that UMass Dartmouth, the tuition and fees are about twelve, thirteen thousand dollars this year. But the John and Abigail Adams is not for twelve or thirteen thousand, it's for the tuition piece, which is just over fourteen hundred dollars. But what we're looking at is putting big drops in the bucket. So it can be discouraging. You think, wow, that's just a little bit of that twelve or 13000 But it's part of the bigger picture. And if you can put a multitude of drops into that bucket and build towards the tuition fees at any school, that's what we're looking at, do. so, at doing. So no scholarship is too, is too small. If you're if you hear of a scholarship that's for $500 and the cost of attendance at the school is upwards of 60 or 70,000, you still want to go for that 500. Every little bit helps. For the need-based aid, that's based on the student's financial need, which is determined from the FAFSA form. So most federal and Massachusetts financial aid is awarded on financial eligibility. Um, many colleges also will base their awards on the financial eligibility as well, but for state schools, um, for a lot of for the need-based aid is based on just financial aid and, and not the merit piece. I mean, you will find that all the state schools, and typically it's through the admissions office, they are awarding significant merit-based awards. So again, you want to be checking out the admissions websites financial aid websites and checking and seeing, you know, when does information need to be in, what do you need to do in order to be considered for as many pieces of financial aid as you possibly can. And also remember too that for many of these um, pieces of aid, maintaining satisfactory academic progress is a prerequisite. So many of these uh, merit-based aid or need-based aid, you need to be meeting a certain grade point average or progressing at a certain rate. So you want to look at what those standards are. And if it's a 3.0 grade point average that the student needs in the following year in order to continue to receive that scholarship, then you want to make certain that you're aware of that and that the student is working towards making that goal the application process, and we all know what that application is, it's the FAFSA. So again, touching on the timeline, remember that each college has different timelines. So whether you're using a Excel spreadsheet or a sheet of paper with lines down it, or a notebook with different pages, write down for each school What's the admissions deadline? When do they need all of the transcripts? Write down the financial aid deadline, the early decision, the early action. Make certain that you're paying attention to when the forms need to be in, because you, you don't want to miss that deadline, and you get it in late, and you might really be losing out on a significant piece of aid. So the FAFSA. The free application for federal student aid, it's required by all colleges. The opening date just went by, it's October 1st. The online site is fafsa.gov. The first year is always the toughest year. You do apply every year, but the first year you're putting all the information in fresh. The second year, a lot of the information rolls over and you're updating simply any changes in the financial information. You log into the FAFSA with an FSA ID, and both the student and the parent need to set up this FSA ID. It can be a little tricky. 
So I'll go repeat this towards the end of the session, but I highly recommend that sooner rather than later, even tonight when you get home, you set up that FSA ID for the student and the parent. And from someone who's personally completed this form every year, the trick that I found with the FAFSA and setting up that password is they're very fussy about that password being a certain number of letters, certain number of, of um, numbers, the special um, key, and it can be dicey. So you'll write down three or four different passwords before you finally get it right. So I would recommend strongly that you look at the guidelines for the password first, make certain that you meet the guidelines, and that, that's really what takes the longest. And remember that you're doing this for both the student and the parent. So you've got a parent name, a student name, parent password, student password. Keep it in a safe place because you're going to be using it year after year and there's also challenge questions that come along with that. To make the process so much easier, the FAFSA also includes a, a tool, it's called the IRS Data Retrieval Tool. So remember that you're looking at your 2018 tax information. But rather than pulling out your tax return and line by line going on that tax return and seeing, oh, I, this is what my adjusted gross is and these are my taxes paid, you can still complete your FAFSA that way, but you can use the Data Retrieval Tool where basically you go through some keystrokes and it takes you to the IRS site where the information is grabbed directly from the IRS. And also keep in mind that your child is not able to see your figures and you're not able to see their figures. So there is some privacy there as well because it's, sometimes that's information that it's there but because of the way the site is set up, it's not shared, okay? You can also complete the FAFSA on your phone, the mobile app. And I believe as of this year, hopefully they've updated it, and by they I mean the Department of Ed, that you can use the data retrieval tool on your mobile app. Remember that the FAFSA must be completed every year and also, as I mentioned earlier, MIFA has a MIFA.org. They have a webinar reporting specifically for completing the FAFSA. So what I find with the FAFSA, it seems like there are certain questions that will just kind of tie you up. And if you go through the FAFSA you know, quickly on this webinar, it will clear up those and you'll be able to get through it. And I do encourage that you complete the FAFSA do it, do it now. You know, we have a long weekend coming up. It's not as bad, they simplified it, and I think that you'll find that um, you'll feel a great relief. So what's reported on the FAFSA? The citizenship information. Um, if the parent's a non-citizen, it's just zeros for the Social Security. The um, student must be a U.S. citizen or an eligible non-citizen in order to receive financial aid. Um, the parent citizenship uh, is, is not relevant. You do one form, okay, so you're not, but you're not completing a separate FAFSA for each school. One form up to 10 schools. So if what you wanted to do is to complete the FAFSA for now and then later on add schools, you can certainly do that. Maybe, right, you know, maybe you're just doing early decision for one school. You want to keep in mind the deadlines for all schools, just in case, but you can easily add schools later on. I'm going to read this information because this can be tricky as far as which parent if there's, um, um, because there's so many different situations. So listen carefully. Information from both parents will be required on the FAFSA regardless of the parent's gender or marital status if both parents are legal parents 
defined as both biological or adoptive, and the student's legal parents live together, okay? Same-sex parents who live together and parents who have never been married who live together have to report both the information, parents' information on the FAFSA, okay? If the parents are divorced or separated, I will read it slowly, only the custodial parent and the custodial parent's current spouse, if there is one, report information on the FAFSA. So it's just the custodial parent. How do you define custodial parent? It's the parent that the student has lived with the most over the past 12 months. If the time spent with both parents is even, the custodial parent is the parent that has provided the most financial support for the student. If the financial support is pretty even, the family needs to select one parent as the custodial parent. The other parent is referred to as the non-custodial parent and doesn't appear anywhere on the FAFSA. I read this through, but it can be dicey for some folks, and if this is a question that you would like to get clarity on, at the end of the session, I'll be happy to go through that. His family size and who the families are living with can sometimes be a challenging question. As I said before, the income is from the two years prior to the beginning of the academic year, so it's the 2018 income that's reported on the 2020-21 FAFSA. Some untaxed income is not included on the FAFSA. Things like foster care benefits or untaxed Social Security. It's clear when you read the FAFSA instructions on what you need to include. I'm just putting in the, that in there so that you know. And if you go to MIFA.org, they have a PDF of the FAFSA to view that has all of the questions. So again, when you're completing the FAFSA and you're opened up to FAFSA.org, I'd also recommend opening up to the MIFA website because it can be a great resource. For other financial aid applications, for many school, the, schools, the only form that they require is the FAFSA form. But for some other colleges, and it's mostly the privates, they're going to also ask for the CSS profile. A school like UMass Dartmouth, we don't require the CSS profile. I'm not an expert on the um, CSS profile, but this will ask you for two years prior as the main information, but also ask for some other basic income totals from previous years. The fee for the profile is $25 for the first profile and $16 for each additional school. If a student is applying early decision or early action, the profile may be required earlier than the regular financial aid deadline. So let that resonate there. And that's why I say really focus on those deadlines. So if your son or daughter is applying to a private school, early decision, you complete the FAFSA, you can do that now. Look at, make certain that you're meeting that FAFSA date and that profile date if they require it for early decision because very likely it's different from the traditional admissions process. Everybody with me? You guys are, uh, all your eyes are open. I'm impressed. We're, we're getting there. The profile student dashboard will also impro provide important information like the deadlines and the next steps. Schools have an entire process by which a family can appeal the requirement for a non-custodial parent to submit the profile, but a parent's, non-custodial parent's unwillingness to complete the profile is not considered an adequate reason for not including that information. And actually, it would be the same with the FAFSA. You have many students that 
will say, and of course you all are here tonight, will say my parents won't complete the FAFSA and they're refusing to do it. They, they, we still need the parent financial information on the FAFSA and signed off in order for the student to be considered for traditional financial aid. So you've gone through the FAFSA, you completed it, you did the CSS profile, but it ain't over, okay? So what happens next? When you complete the FAFSA, it's sent off electronically and it's processed by the Central Processing Center for the FAFSA information. And then it's sent, the information is sent to all of the schools that were listed on that FAFSA. So at the beginning, it could be one or 10 schools. And that changes too. Many students will go back in the parent would have to sign off on it again, but you can add other schools after the fact. They have a last minute school that they'd like to add. The student is gonna receive a student aid report. It's also called an SAR. It's a summary of the FAFSA answers. Just had a student come in last week. Parents made 49,000 and 49,149, I think it was. And coincidentally, the student also made 49149 Can you imagine what that did for her financial aid eligibility? And her question coming in is, gee, I got a lot of aid last year. What happened this year? And we looked at it and saw that, gee, this is, is not correct. So strong advice, after you've completed the FAFSA, the student is either going to be emailed if they provided an email on the FAFSA form, or it will be mailed, a summary of all that financial aid. Check that information, or not financial aid, financial information. Check that information, make certain the schools are listed, make certain that there weren't any extra zeros and that the information is correct. For many families, you're also going to be selected for verification. And this is about a third of the group. So for verification, it's when the Department of Ed is basically saying, we want you to double check about a third of the FAFSA population that have applied and make certain that the information is correct that they put on their FAFSA. Well, if you use the data retrieval tool, it makes it so much easier for you because we will not have to request tax transcripts because you have that out there. Now some families can't complete a tax transcript. Maybe there's an amended return. Um, there's different circumstances where you might not be able to use the data retrieval tool. But I strongly encourage you to use it, if you, particularly if you down the line find out that you're selected for verification. You don't know when you're completing the FAFSA they're gonna select you. I don't know if they have a big um, wheel that they spin, but as I say, it is about 30% of the population, and it just makes it a lot easier. And then um, the other piece of information is it's usually a, a worksheet, and it asks you to verify the family size, um, if the student wasn't working, what they're just pretty straightforward information. You sign off, and you're done with the verification process. Pay attention if you're selected for verification, and this is when you'll start getting information too from the schools, letting you know if they need additional information in order to verify the financial information on that FAFSA form. Communicate with the students directly, because know that at this point in time, and this is where the shift comes, where information's com being communicated to the student directly and not necessarily to the parent. So you may not know unless you checked the verification, uh, I'm sorry, the, the student aid report, you might not know that the student was selected for verification because the student was sent to his email address or her email address. So this is where those pieces are really, um, you know, start having that communication and work it through with your, your son or daughter. getting there. You've done the FAFSA. You know it was done correctly. 
you've checked over all the figures, your son or daughter is kind of narrowing down where they want to go, and I know for myself, I was like, well, we got to see if we can pay for this, and this is where some real distinctions can be made. So if you were kind of like, yeah, 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 through this session, this is, a, a, I think, really will perk your interest. Okay. Every school has a cost of attendance. And the cost of attendance is made up of the tuition and fees, the room and board, and that would be even if the student's commuting. We know that it costs something to heat the room in the house, books and supplies, transportation, and personal expenses. So you have all of those pieces of pie that are consistent with every school that a student is going to be attending, all right? So now we come to the expected family contribution. When you complete the FAFSA form, the key number that comes out of that FAFSA is that expected family contribution. And it's what the formula, and the Department of Ed's formula, has determined that the family can contribute towards their education. And this is going to be consistent across the board at every school for federal aid. If it's, the school's using a um, profile form, then it can shift as well, but that would be for their institutional aid, not for the federal. It's the same federal formula for every family and it lets you know this is what the government is expecting the family to pay towards the education. If I was going to ask you to circle any one of the slides, this would be it. And some, I spoke with somebody yesterday about this and I told, I said I'm going to be emphasizing this. The net price calculator. So if this whole pamphlet Circle the net price calculator, and this is why. Every institution is required by the federal government to have on their website a net price calculator. So if you're thinking about, your son or daughter's thinking about going to Northeastern, go to the Northeastern website, and on their search bar, put in net price calculator. It'll take you to a link and you'll input estimates of the key pieces of financial and household size information and so forth. It's not very many questions. It takes maybe five minutes, 10 minutes to do. And it's, the results are only as good as those figures that are putting in. But if you're accurate on those figures, it takes the figures that you've put in and it will give you a solid estimate of what you can expect that school to award you down the line, okay? So if you're trying now to get an estimate of, gee, can we even consider this school? If it's a $70,000 school and they're estimating that they're gonna give you 20 and you know that your son or daughter, it's up in Boston and they'll be living on campus and that you'll be expected to then, you know, you do the math, 70 minus 20 is 50. That gives you an idea of, gee, I don't know if this is going to work or not. Now, I'm not at all saying don't apply for that school, to that school because there's merit, there's different things that can be, you know, that can occur. But if you're putting all your eggs in one basket, it kind of gives you an idea of what you can expect. It also can give you that real positive result because if you plug those figures in and it's a $70,000 school and their estimated package and it will tell you what to expect and it breaks it out on grants, work study, scholarships, and loans. And if it gets, comes down where they're going to be potentially giving you 50, and that leaves you with 20, well, maybe that's something, gee, we can work with that. See what I'm saying? So net price calculator. It's on every website. 
and start checking it out now as your son or daughter is looking at different schools. Don't let it rule out a school, but just kind of keep it in mind. So as I said, every school has a cost of attendance, and that cost of attendance can vary considerably. I'm going to give you some specific examples. But remember the expected contribution, you just completed one FAFSA form, so that expected family contribution should be consistent. So if you subtract the expected family contribution from the cost of attendance, that's going to give the financial aid eligibility. So your next question will be, well, what's the school going to do with that? Are they going to meet my finance? How much will they meet that financial aid eligibility? So the first example that I have here, it, I mean, I'm going to go back to the information that you put on the FAFSA. Okay. So we have a example of a family with four in the family, one in college. The income for the parent across the board is 75000 But you have family A, they weren't able to put any money aside for assets. They, so when they put it, completed the asset information on the FAFSA, they put in zero. They had zero money in the bank. Family B, they were middle in the road. They knew that they had kids in college. They set aside $75,000 over the years to use towards the education or emergencies or whatever. And then family C was able to do really well. They were able to put $150,000 in the bank, and they put that on their FAFSA as assets. Now the next line down, the EFC, just so that you know how assets can affect that family contribution. For the family A that had nothing in the bank but they made 75 grand, their family contribution just over $7,000, 7,223. The family that has the $70,000, $75,000 in the bank, the EFC, the difference of that 75,000 only 3,199 is used towards the contribution. So it's really small. The assets, you can have quite a bit in the bank and not be significantly penalized. And that's what the purpose is of this slide, is just to let you know that assets, you, you might be doing okay. Even for the family that has 150 grand, the difference is $7,500, okay? Now the next slide is when it gets interesting, because again, now we're looking at the family and the income impact. So again, you have a family of four, you have one in college, and across the board, the family, each of the family A, B, and C, each of them had 50 grand in the bank. But look at the parent combined income. For family A, it was 75,000, for family B, it was 100,000. Family C, it was 150,000. And now go down to the EFC. For the first family, it's only 9,025. Jump up to, fa to family C, 33,053. So you can see that income is really significantly held as part of the family contribution. If I lost you on that, which I don't think I did, but if I lost you, I wanted to take a look at those slides again, and I'll be happy to talk with you about it after. And it's all done through, through their calculation. So now we're talking specifically about how different schools will meet the need. So you have, in this slide, a school where cost of attendance is $70,000. And there are many schools out there that are $70,000. The little blue part on that, the family contribution is $5,000. School B is 45,000. 
but you see the family contribution? Still 5,000. And again, for um, school C, 30,000. Family contribution is still 5,000. And now we have the next school, which is 10,000, which is probably a community college. $10,000 school, family contribution, same as that school up for that 70 grand, it's still $5,000. So what we're looking at here is we wanna see, well, and you wanna be looking at how, is the different, how are the different schools meeting that big gap? Because for the first school, it's $65,000 that are, you know, do they have that money or not? And that's where that net price calculator will give you an idea of are they even coming close to that? So for the college with the cost of attendance of 45,000. The EFC is 5,000. They're coming up with grants and scholarships. The grant is 17,500 and the scholarships 9,500. Student loans, 5,500, and you're gonna probably see that consistent across the board. Work study, 2,000. Unmet need, 5,500. Now this is the school that's for 45,000, okay? The unmet need and the family contribution is the family's responsibility. So you're gonna be saying with this school, you're gonna to need to come up with 55 plus five, so 10,500. The award letters are gonna vary depending on the school. So we have college A, B, and C. Look at the difference in the, in the grants and scholarships between the same school, or be, between the different schools with the same cost of attendance. You've got a school that's $45,000, but you've got significantly more aid and therefore less unmet need for college A as opposed to college C. So be looking at those grant money amounts for the different schools. Because it, it's, you know, for, for many of us, that's what's making the decision. For this example, we have award letters and the types of aid. You can see that the unmet need can be the same, but with this particular example, look at the parent loans. You have college A, zero parent loan. You have college B, 10,000 college loan. And you have college C, $29,000 parent loan. So the unmet need is the same for each of the schools, but the expectation is that the parent is going to fill that unmet need with that parent loan. So the purpose of this slide is to let you know that when that award letter comes, you not only want to look at what the unmet need is, but you want to really focus on how that unmet need is being filled. And look at the long range plan too, as far as if the expectation is that, you know, if it's a four year school, are you prepared to borrow that kind of money for four years? Do you have other children that are also going through school? Do you have other children that have already gone through school and you're paying on loans for those students. The purpose isn't to scare you in this, it's to make you aware of the, of, you know, the investment that you're making. So as far as filling the unmet need, which is what we've been discussing here, well, this is when you're sitting down with your son and daughter and figuring out, okay, how much can we put towards the education? So you might have a conversation and say, well, 
your son or daughter has a thousand dollars that they can put towards the schooling and the parent might have in this case four thousand dollars that they have available to put towards the bill there also might be a payment plan like, like during the year all schools pretty exclusively they all have payment plans so if you're thinking that each semester or each month you have X number of dollars, you could have a payment plan, you spread it out over nine months, and it could total another 5,000. So along with that, an educational loan, which is what we're talking about, is another 10,000. So if the balance is 20 grand and you've, you're taking from savings, you're putting in from a payment plan, and then you're also putting in through a private lender, then you've got your unmet need taken care of. So now we're getting down to, all right, looking at how do we make this manageable? Well, maybe starting at a community college might be the way to, might be the way to go. You start at the community college, you get the basic general courses under the belt, and then you transfer over to the university. Many students do that. They start off at BCC, they get those courses taken care of, and then transfer either to UMass down here, um, UMass Amherst, um, you know, Bridgewater, um, UNH, wherever. Okay. You also need to be thinking, as I um, hope I touched on enough too, that we're talking about typically, you know, it's bachelor's degree, four years. So you've got, you've got to be looking at it in the long term, not just for the single year and then you're done with it. Each year you complete that FAFSA. Each year, if you're borrowing for the first year, you're probably going to be borrowing for the second year as well. Or you need to factor that in to what's going on within, in your life. Know your credit score if you are looking to borrow under a private loan, because these private loans are credit-based. And again, Compare each school's net price. So this is when you put the graph up. It becomes very clear whether you can, uh, you know, you can afford the school. But don't also, um, don't refrain from speaking with the financial aid office as well as far as, okay, how do I make this happen? That's what, that's what a lot of my days are, is working with students and parents now and figuring out, okay, how do we make it work? You also have options. There's the mass transfer, which I spoke to you about, which is um, you know, transferring from the community college. There's also um, there's a, a tuition break. So if you are going to one of the regional schools, New England regional schools, there's certain programs. So say your son or daughter wanted to go to UNH, and they were in applying to a particular program that wasn't offered in one of our um, state schools then there's a considerable discount. As far as what those particular programs are, you'd have to go to the website. I don't know them specifically, but don't, I don't want anyone to walk away ruling out. There's a, lots of different ways of, of approaching the different schools. And the website is there for that information. There's lots of um, free resources. Financial aid re renewability, um, learn more, ask about special circumstances. If you have a situation where, remember we're basing the FAFSA on the 2018 income, there's been a, maybe there's been a significant financial change in 2018 on your tax return, not something like, well, you needed a new roof or you have credit card debt, those things aren't looked at. But if the income has changed and maybe there was a layoff or a change um, illness, then certainly work with the financial aid office at the school to see if there's some special consideration that can be made. Everything would need to be documented so it can be a process as far as getting those, um, those pieces of information in, but special circumstances or professional judgments is what we also call them. That's something that we do frequently. There is a FAFSA day, and there's FAFSA day. I wrote it down. Um, there's a, a site, Bridgewater, 
uh, BCC, uh, Cape Cod Tech, and I think it was November 6th and November 9th, if you need help on the FAFSA. I do think, though, that if you go to the uh, MIFA website and you go on to their FAFSA webinar, it doesn't take long to go through that, and it will really ease that process. There's also, you were given a handout for the Educational Opportunity Center, and they have the sheets that are up when you came in. They can also assist you with completing that FAFSA form. The EOC's been around for a long time, and they're excellent. After the college um, accepted seminars, this is something that MIFA puts on. They have a, um, special seminars that are set up. They're in the spring, and they can help you to navigate the, um, the, the schedule isn't set yet, but if you go onto their website, they're not held at the high school at that time, but they are regional. I haven't been to one, but it's something that certainly if you are got some choices and you're really trying to figure, gee, they're all good choices, but what makes the best financial sense? MIFA is a wonderful resource. That's it. So what I'd like you all to do, if you could please, is there is a, a seminar evaluation that you all would have received. If you could complete that for feedback, let us know what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. Sign up for me for emails. Tonight when you go home, focus on that FSA ID, okay? Just if you can get that done, even just yours, and also, have a conversation with your son or daughter on what schools, if you could go to any school next September, which one would it be? And practice the net price calculator on that school. As I say, just go into the search engine on that, you know, if it's, I keep saying Northeastern, go into Northeastern, UMass, wherever, and just search in net price calculator and play with it. You're not locked in. They don't know that it's, it's you. you're just looking to get an idea. And as you work with it more often, you'll feel more comfortable. Sign up for webinars at MIFA.org and reference the MIFA's College Admissions and Financial Aid Timeline, which I think might be helpful to you. Social media, we have all the links there for MIFA. And again, my name is Pam Payton, and I'm from UMass Dartmouth. I will be happy to stay and answer any of your questions.